The book of Samuel, particularly 1 Samuel, comes at an interesting time. It's the end of the season of the judges. That's when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, you know, what we used to call like the Wild West. They were just doing whatever. And the period of the judges was over. You might remember that in the earlier chapters, um, there was the story of Hannah, and then she had a son named Samuel, and I'll go back to that a moment. And then Samuel grew up and was mentored in the temple under Eli because his eyes were growing dim, which was not just a physical condition, but it was a spiritual condition. Because we later saw that Eli, being the priest in Shiloh, where the ark was kept, was really not able to discipline his own sons, Phineas and Hopney, and so they were wanton and wild and really abusing the people of God and taking the choice meat from the sacrifice. So this is a book that leads into other major names. But the marvelous thing about the Word of God is that when we get through all of the stories, we're reminded not just to look at what's on the page. Don't just look at what's happening locally, either in the text or in our lives, but to know that underneath there is a deep reality. There's a reality that says that no matter what is going on, that God is still working and bringing about his purposes. No matter how bad it looks, how hopeless it looks, the plan of God will not be ultimately frustrated, but he's still working. So when we look in Samuel, uh, it, it's a book of transition because I said the judges were over and little Samuel who grew up in the temple uh, had to give a hard word of judgment from the Lord to Eli to let him know that his time was over. And uh, that became true through several things that happened subsequently in the story. But Samuel grew up and he functioned uh, really as a priest, having been under Eli a priest. But he also functioned as a judge, kind of an administrative judge. And because they were moving from judgeship to kingship, in the interim, he really functioned with the duties and the auspices of a king. So here's someone who, whether it's official or not, is functioning as priest, as judge, and as king, and he is clearly a prophet. That's a lot. What happens to people when they get overloaded with titles? When they get too many positions, whether they're empowered officially by them or whether they are self-obtained, even though there's a clear need for Samuel, he is the transition man for Israel, right? And we know what it is to be in transition. Sometimes I feel like when I think now, it feels like the whole world is kind of feeling its way along. That, that, that institutions, education, politics, economics, I know everybody says, I got it together, but it feels like we're kind of feeling our way along. What, what next? What, what delay of thousands of planes? What disasters? What fires on the West Coast? What, what, what kind of hurricanes and floods and markets changing and not knowing whether or not this will lead to something beyond just some inflation? It, it's like everyone is feeling their way along, almost as though we have the dim eyes of Eli, even though we are called as the body of Christ to be the priest in the place where the ark of God rests. And so it is that we see Samuel juxtaposed between the judges and the new dispensation that's coming in of the kings. Are you with me so far? So he's not physically, just as a metaphor. He's pretty loaded. I mean, he's really weaponized with all of these titles. He's, you need a prophet? Here I am. You need a priest? I'm here. You need somebody to do administrative justice? I'm here. We don't have a king yet, so he can exercise the kingly duties. So here he is in the middle. And I wasn't there, obviously, despite how old I look. I really was not there. <clears throat> but I think human nature doesn't change that much. And I can imagine that in a transition time, when God is moving from judgeship to kingship, that if it feels real good in the transition, you really might not want things to move on. Like, this is not so bad. I mean, Samuel really didn't like the idea of anointing a king in the beginning. But the Lord told him, let it go. Get over it. The people want a king. I'm going to give them a king. That's what they asked for. I'm going to give them a king. But Saul resisted, I'm sorry, Samuel resisted in his spirit, <clears throat> anointing Saul as the king. You can get over the hoarseness. It's not a big deal. 
And so he's in the middle. So I just imagine that he wasn't too eager, that he really wasn't on board with this shift from maybe didn't want judgeship anymore, agreed that Eli was not in the right place to be the priest. But why bring in Saul as the first king? That's one thing I want you to keep in mind for the context. The other thing is there's a struggle going on. In the transition, there's opposition. There's external opposition and there's internal opposition. The external opposition for Israel is that the Philistines are constantly attacking them and they're raids after raids. Sometimes they do well. Even uh, Samuel, not really being a military person, but he was successful in helping Israel get a victory. Uh, Saul was not really... Uh, he was new in his position once he was anointed king, but they had some victories and then they had some defeats. So when you're fighting externally, it's hard to be fighting internally. So they're fighting, oh, you don't know anything about that. They're fighting the Philistines as the enemy on the outside. But then there's an internal struggle among the Israelites because Saul and Samuel really don't get along that well. Uh, and we see that in a sub couple of cases. One way we see it is that Samuel said to Saul, okay, the, I'm not giving you the scripture quite in order yet. Uh, you're going to have to fight the Philistines somewhere around chapter 10, he says this. I'll be back. Wait for me seven days, and I'll offer the fellowship offering or the peace offering so that that'll kind of, you know, give confidence to the army before they go to battle. So Saul waited seven days. But Samuel didn't come back in time. And he started losing men and his army was dissipating. And he was afraid because at that point they had a large army to fight among the Philistines. So what he did was, he did follow instructions. He went and began to offer the burnt offering and the peace offering himself. And just as he finished doing it, who walked in? Saul. Now some writers have said this was really a cat and mouse game. That maybe, just maybe, that that was too much of a coincidence. Was he set up to fail? Did Saul say, you're not to do this. I'm supposed to do it. So wait seven days. But when Saul doesn't show up, somehow, I'm sorry, when Samuel doesn't show up on time, Saul has now violated the boundaries coming out of his space. And he has moved over in the space that's reserved for the prophet to do and for the priest. Are you with me? What happens when the church is running the politics, but I'm more concerned about when the politics tries to run the church. What happens when there is this fading over and this bleeding over in times of transition when we're trying to feel our way? When we're going from one place in the world and one place in the country to another and it's not clear what there are defined places. This is the job of the prophet. This is the job of the priest. This is, we think, the job of the king. There had never been another king. Saul was the first one. There was no road map. There was no precedence. He was trying to figure it out because he, this was a next that he was not prepared for. And so now Saul's not too happy that I said it wrong. Samuel is not too happy that Saul is offering the sacrifice that he said, that's my job to do, all right? And those of you that are sympathetic with the characters, I mean, if you can really relate to them like regular people, Samuel comes back at Saul pretty heavy. He's really harsh. I mean, after all, he did wait seven days and, and, and the prophet was late. And he said, you did not obey the commandment of God. Scholars have been trying to figure out what commandment was that. We're not sure. Nobody's found what commandment that is that he didn't obey yet. Was well, somehow, was Samuel thinking that his words and God's words were automatically the same? He, he said, your, your kingdom is not going to last. God would have established your dynasty, your kingdom forever, but now it's not because you have stepped over into my territory. Maybe, maybe not. We do know that the Lord had found someone who was after his own heart, and that's David who comes later. But there's still personality here, and positions here, and roles here, and power here, and, and kind of a self-interest going on. Are you with me? That's true. One third point, and we'll get a little more into the scripture. Don't leave yet, all right? When you leave, I want to leave. Don't, don't, please don't leave me standing up here. 
the wonderful thing about scripture, now this, this grabs me emotionally because I cry over the word. I love the word so much next to God and my husband. Is he in here yet? Well, they might, sometime they run neck and neck. I really love the word of God. And the beautiful thing about scripture is it assumes that we don't have to catch the lesson the first time. The same point is made over and over and over. So let's go back and look at the beginning of Samuel. Chapter 1. Who's the main character? Hannah. Remember Hannah? Hannah's the one that is the mother of Samuel. Hannah is barren, and she has a child. So now chapter 1 echoes all the way over to 1 Samuel chapter 14. And when there's an echo, it comes back, but it comes back with a little different amount of volume or it repeats. Are you with me? So chapter 1 is echoing what's going to come back or putting out what's going to come back in 14. So to understand chapter 14, because our main character is not going to be Moses or uh, even uh, Saul or Samuel, our main character is going to be Jonathan. Because when the Lord works, he doesn't just work with the big folks. He takes little people like Abner and Abishag. He takes folks that we have to look up and say, who were they? And they're a central part of God's plan. So what happens in chapter one? Hannah has a child out of barrenness, out of emptiness. Hannah births a child, a child that's going to be a part of the transition and move from the old to the new, not just 2022 to 2023, but a whole set of ideas, traditions and rituals into a new way for the body and for fellowship in life. This is a time of transition. This is a time of transformation, but the people are traumatized because of an external enemy. And then there's a level of internal stress because of an internal battle. So when we see Hannah birthing Samuel, we are given to know that out of her barrenness came life. Out of her desperation and despair came hope. Out of her emptiness came the very fruit that would bring a change for Israel. Are you with me now? So in chapter 1, the seeds are embedded for what we'll find happening over and over and over again, not just in chapter 14, but in your life, in my life, in your life, in your life, that the same word is happening, that out of emptiness, out of impossibilities, out of what looks like it's not going to happen, out of it looks like that none of the prerequisites are there for the condition, out of all of that, out of the heartbreak, out of the tears, out of the long nights, out of all of the sorrow, out of everything that seemed to make it impossible, that God is still birthing out of barrenness. He's still looking for Hannah's. That's not a gender statement. So now you've got the setup. You've got the battles. You've got his transition time. You've got the old rituals. They, they were okay, but they're not meant for now. It's a new day. It's time for the wheel. It's time for a new generation. But it's built on an old experience. Are you with me? So in this transition, John Caesar, is there anything else I want to say about that chapter one. I think that's it. I think that'll do it. So now what happens is you've got these tension between Samuel and Saul because Saul has stepped over into Samuel's territory and Samuel's not particularly happy about it and he's given him a word of doom and gloom, right? Now we're ready for chapter 14. Would you read for us beginning at verse 15, Mr. Oles, maybe through the end of verse 21 in the New Revised Standard Version? There was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. Okay, we're going to go over that again. There was a pandemic in the camp. No, no, what, what does it say? Panic. There, there's a panic because of a pandemic that was in the camp. There was a panic in the camp, and not just in the camp where the people were, but it was also... In the field. It was everywhere. It was just all around the world. And it was among all the people, everywhere. 
and the garrison, the people who were charged to be the army, the fortified folks, and even the raiders. These were the bad folks. These were, what would you call them, like special seals or I don't know what you call other units. Help me out. Navy SEALs and Special Forces, that sounds good. That's the Raiders. Okay, they trembled. And not only were they trembling because of the external enemy, but because God was in it, he caused the earth to tremble. Now, this panic was not just the panic that came because of the external forces. This is a panic that God promoted. Have you ever been in a place and you said, I can't do anything with my enemy? They're just out of sorts. They don't listen to reason. And all of a sudden, God gets in the mix and turns them around. And that person that was spewing out so much anger and fight becomes humble. And you go, what is this? Or, or they begin, your enemies begin to take each other out. I don't mean physically. We're not talking about that kind of elimination. But they begin to minimize each other's influence and power. That's when God gets in it, and there's a panic. Continue, please. Saul's lookouts in Gibeah of Benjamin were watching as the multitude was surging back and forth. Okay, so Saul's the king. He has the armies, and he had lookouts. He had spies. And they looked out, and they saw that there was this panic going on on the Philistine side. Then Saul said to the troops that were with him, call the roll and see who has gone from us. When they had called the roll, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of the Lord here. For at that time, the ark of the Lord went with the Israelites. When Saul was talking to the priests, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. And Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into battle, and every sword was against the other, so that there was a very great confusion. Now the Hebrews, who previously had been with the Philistines and had gone up with them into the camp, turned and joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Thank you. That's it. All right. When I went to school, oh, we now talk about how long ago that was. We had to say the Lord's Prayer. Someone took the Bible and you read a, usually a psalm. You don't know anything about that. And uh, you did the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And you had to do all that pretty much from memory, so you could read from the Bible. One person up here is acting like they know what I'm talking about. Thank you very much. It's in the dark ages. All right. And then... What happened was the teacher took this big book, this big black book, and you had better be in your seats, sitting, saying, yes. I went to a school where you didn't say yes, ma'am. That was considered not appropriate. You said yes, and you said no. And she opened the book, and she would call your name, and you would answer and say, present. Or you would say, here. What's your name? Any? Okay, Terrell. And your name? Say it loud. Oh. Peyton? Thank you. All right. Since you wonder where they got me from, what's your name? Sir? Yes. I met him. Okay, but that's all right. We'll do Ernest. Ernest? Present. Blame. Blame. Present. Present. So imagine if, thank you, imagine if your name is called and you're supposed to be in your seat, in your place, doing what you're supposed to do. And when the name is called, you're to answer. You're in the army of Saul. He's going through the ranks, the military order, probably from uh, either from the ascending order or descending order, and they're calling the names, and they should say present or here. But when he called the roll, he saw that Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Our title for tonight is Unauthorized Leave. Unauthorized Leave. When you're not in the place, where people expect you to be. 
You're not doing what they've always done. You're not acting like they predicted you should act. You're going after goals that they said were out of your league. You're exercising the gifts that God has given you, even though there doesn't seem to be a, a need or a demand for them. And so when people look for you to be that, 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 that image that they have put on you and prescribed, and when they call you or they look for you or they expect you to act one way and another way, when the role is called, now this is not the role that's called up yonder, I'll be there. We're not talking about that role. But when the role on earth is called, and organizations and people have expectations and have put you in small cubicles and small boxes, told you how far you could go and how much you could do and what you could understand and what you couldn't understand, there are very, <clears throat> very few of us that probably somewhere along in life, whether it was a teacher or a family member that didn't tell us we were not worthy, you didn't have enough. Don't take this course. You're, you're not smart enough to take chemistry. Don't try this job. Just settle for this. When that happens, that's a roll call that's going out. And there's an expectation that you will sit in the predetermined spot that some individual or some society or some organization or some club or some family member has prescribed for you. And when you are not there, there is an unauthorized leave. Tonight, we're looking for folks that are willing to have their name called, but they're not gonna be in the place. They're not gonna be doing the thing. They're not gonna be saying what others said they would be saying. They're not gonna fit the description. They're not gonna match the bill. They're coming a whole different way because it's transition time. Because it's time for one process to go out and another paradigm to come in. It's an uneasy time where there are external struggles and internal pressures. It's a time when it doesn't make sense and we're all like Eli's feeling our way, but out of that barrenness, we're still going to be on unauthorized leave. Let's walk through this text. If I can keep my screen on a little bit. What we find, and now you can go with us. We're not going to read it. I like to go line by line, but I've already taken up most of the time. So just stay with us if you're streaming. And if you're in the room, please. Let's go back to the beginning of chapter 14. Now, I'm looking at an NRSV, but in my mind, there are several different translations. And so one in particular says, it came up on a day. The, the NRSV in, in verse 1 will say something like one day. But nothing just happens one day. There was a series of things that came to that day. So it came upon a day that Jonathan, now Jonathan legally would be the rightful heir to the throne. He is Saul, the first king's son. And it's on this day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor. So this is his armor bearer. And so to be that kind of person who goes on authorized, unauthorized leave, one understands, as Bishop says to us regularly, that it's something bigger than just us. It's more than one person can do. And so what he does is he turns to the person. There's no class distinction going on here. There's no royalty versus lack of royalty. There's no, there, there's no groupiness going on. This is the person who is in his so-called community while they're out here in the war and the, and the field for war. They're part of the army. See, Saul had had 3,000 uh, soldiers. He kept 2,000 of them in a previous chapter. He gave 1,000 to Jonathan. And they're camped on a hill, a big high cliff called a crag, and there are two cliffs. So the Israelites are on one high cliff with the valley in between, and the uh, Philistines, the enemies, on another. So they both are in high advantage places. But the disadvantage is that the Philistines, when, when Saul won a little small victory, he got excited about it and said, blow the horn. And when he blew the horn, he was trying to rally the people to come and celebrate their victory and get ready to fight the Philistines. But when he blew the horn, and this is what's coming to my mind. It's like he blew it too soon. When he blew the horn, he not only rallied the Israelites, but it rallied the enemy. And so the enemy came out as well and came out with 30,000 chariots. I think it was 6,000 horsemen. And at that point, it doesn't matter how many other people. So now where they were going to celebrate, 
They were quaking and fearful. They're on this high place with a low place in between. The enemy's up on another high place, but it looks like an irresolvable problem for the Israelites. Are you with me? Because they are small in number. His army is dissipating. They're leaving. They looked over there and it says they went, some of them went to hide in dugouts. They went in hideouts, depending on what translation you're reading. It'll tell you where they went to hide. And so he looked up and now he only had 600 men where he started out with this 2,000 on his side and 1,000 on Jonathan's and he's down to 600. Now the interesting thing, I'm sorry about all this background, but I'm really not sorry. When you read, I'm not sure where you read it. It's either at the end of the other chapter or it's stuck somewhere in this chapter. You'll find that the domination of the Philistines is also a psychological warfare. It's not just they, uh, they outnumber the Israelites, but in order for the Israelites to, they were not allowed to have any blacksmiths in their camp. Now, I know you don't know what a blacksmith is. I really don't either. I don't have any horses to shoe, but I remember a little bit about the Westerns, okay? That's the only thing I know about a blacksmith. So there were, they, they, now get this, the Israelites were not permitted to have blacksmiths. It was a vocation that they were kept out of. You, you cannot, you can have a, because if you have blacksmiths, you could sharpen your weapons. You could sharpen your sword. You could sharpen your plows. And so this meant that they could not uh, on their own be self-sufficient and plant seed and bring harvest unless they took their agricultural tools to the enemy to sharpen and had to pay an exceptional cost. They could not sharpen their swords because, well, actually, they weren't allowed to have swords. And the scripture tells us that there was only one sword in the camp, and that was in Saul's camp, and that was his sword. And one sword in Jonathan's camp, and that was Jonathan's sword. So when there's control over, uh, you're not able to really do what it takes to eliminate food deserts. You're not able to do what it takes uh, to, to be well equipped both financially and economically and as entrepreneurs without having to always go to the enemy and pay a cost and get permission just to have, be able to do the things that lead to sustaining and substance. Are you with me? So that does something. Uh, wh 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 where are the technicians? Where are the engineers? Where, where, where are the chemists? Do I have to go over there to get permission? And so that was the situation that they were in. Now let me get back to this chapter. So Jonathan turns to his armor bearer, the person who carries his, his armor, uh, and, and he's making no distinction here in terms of class or anything like that. And he says to him, uh, he says to him, he, uh, he says, come, that's in verse 1, let us go over to the Philistine garrison. Now, it's one thing to have some power or to be empowered. That's good. But when power in, matures, it's no longer about I. It's called we power. And so he's saying, I'm not going alone, but let us go over to the Philistine. Because if I'm oppressed, you're oppressed. And if you're oppressed, I'm oppressed. And if you can't sharpen a tool, neither can I. And if I can't sharpen a tool, then we, we can't really have community and independence. And so what happens when there's maturity and power, it becomes, one is no longer so independent, but they embrace interdependence where they need each other. And so uh, what happens is he says this to his armor bearer, but Jonathan did not tell his father that he was going. His father would have probably said, don't go, stay in your place. Sit in your seat. When I call you, I need you to be where I left you. He did not tell his father. And his father, Saul, was on the outskirts. I'm gonna underscore some words for you. We're, we're in a different kind of class sitting. Are you with me? Remember, you're not just reading what's on the page, you're reading what's beneath it and the reality. He's sitting on the outskirts of the city. Very much like Eli said in the gates, having to get what's going on secondhand and thirdhand, not really willing to be in the fray. Now, normally when I talk about this text, I talk about he's sitting under a pomegranate tree, a tree with fruit, with seeds in it. 
uh, wasting away, just sitting under a tree, in the middle of a battle, sitting in the shade. Armies there, but, but paralyzed, no equipment, no swords, nothing to fight with. Just people defenseless, like sitting ducks under a pomegranate tree. A pomegranate tree, a fruit full of seeds, representing the word of God, but not accessing the law that Moses has given them. Not taking the word, the seed, and putting it into their spirit, just sitting under the tree. But he's sitting on the outskirts. He's sitting on the edge. He's sitting on the margin. He's sitting outside of the city that's part of what he needs to defend. So I want you to get this image of Saul who is sitting more passively as opposed to Jonathan metaphorically who is more willing to be engaged, who's willing to take an unauthorized leave. And so he doesn't tell his father because he doesn't have, his father doesn't have the same mentality. He's sitting there with the 600 men and the contrast are very vivid. What Saul does is he called for, I think his name is Ahijah, that's where I'm going to pronounce it, who is part of the house of Eli. So what we are to know because we read our Bibles is that he is suspect as a priest because he comes from a line of priests that have been dismissed, that have been... Uh, uh, taken off of the role, as it were, because of Eli's weakness and because of his son's sin, and they have failed. So the lineage of Eli as a priesthood is not acceptable. But this is who Saul depends on, maybe because it's tradition, maybe because it's custom, maybe because they've always done it that way. So Saul is sitting there, and he calls for Ahijah, and he tells him to bring the ephod. Now, in one place it'll say, it tells him to bring the ark, and then it says, again, to bring the ephod. We believe it was the ephod, and that that's a scribal heir, because the ark should have been in Shiloh, according to what we see in other scriptures. But the ephod was a way that he would use, and it had been given to them in the Old Testament, but it was a way of trying to get an oracle. It was a way of trying to get, I need another word. I need, I need another prophecy. I can't do it unless somebody tells me that, 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 that it's going to be okay. And he's calling for him so he can get some sense of what's going on and what he should do in the war. But while he is going back and relying on his traditions and his rituals, Jonathan is already laying a plan to go forward. And so what happens is Jonathan turns to his, his um, armor bearer and he says, we're going to go over. I want you to go over with me. Now, a small detail, but for some it'll be significant. The word that's used for Elijah, he is carrying the ephod, this kind of oracle, like a big vest and with pockets, and we believe he would go in it, almost like a kind of predictive, prophetic, I don't want to call it fortune-telling, because it, it did have some status. But on the other side, you've got Jonathan, who is putting his faith and his trust in God. He's not looking for another word, but he remembers how the Lord has said he would be with Israel. He's in dialogue with the God because our faith should be dialogical. In other words, it should be a conversation, not something locked up just in a book or reserved for Sunday mornings. And God's language in the conversation is usually promise and command. Our language in the conversation is usually prayer and praise. And the two should be going back and forth. So Jonathan has gotten into his heart that even though we're out numbered on that side. I believe that if I don't have to do it all by myself, I'm not interested in whether you're learned, unlearned, trained, over 21, under 21, but if we could just get together and hook up, I believe that we could outdo the enemy that's sitting on that other mountain. I believe that we could conquer and do something not just to get freedom for the army, not just deliverance for Jonathan and the armor bearer, but deliverance for the people in all of Israel. And the interesting thing that I was about to tell you for I forgot is that the word that's used for the carrier, the priest, outlaw, band, priest that's coming to uh, Saul, the word that's used there is the same word that's used for armor bear. So it's the writer is saying to us, compare the difference between who Saul turns to uh, for weight and, and as opposed to who Jonathan is turning to. Are you with me? So one is carrying armor. The other one's not carrying armor, but it still is what is being relied on in order to go forth. Okay, I keep losing my page here. 
So if I read, if you'll read the next verse for me, Brother Oles, if you have it. So while he's doing this, these two high places, uh, one is called um, Sinna, and I think the other is called Bozes. And Bozes, that's of these two mountain peaks, is called Shiny, the, uh, means shiny, and Sinna means thorny. Now in another session, we would talk about what it is to be between the crown and the thorns, and how life has a passageway that means it's low, but it takes going by the thorns to get the victory and to get the crown. But what it is, is Jonathan in verse six said to the young man, he repeats, he says, come on, let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. And I like it because he's not being insulting, but he's recognizing that we are God's people, that we are chosen. It sounds like an echo that David later on, when he talks about Goliath, wants to know, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who are these people that come against the army of God? So he says, and he's rallying himself and the armor bearer. He says, and this is key. He said, it may be, hear the echo. This is Daniel, the book of Daniel. He said, it may be that the Lord will act for us for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Do you hear that? When they were gonna throw him in the lion's den, they said, King, we don't know. He said, but we know our God is able. Now, what I like about this is that Jonathan is now moved out of the physical situation and he's moved into a situation that doesn't depend on being outnumbered. It doesn't depend on how many swords there are. It doesn't depend on how many chariots there are. It doesn't depend on how many degrees there are. It doesn't depend on the size of the bank account. It doesn't depend on family pedigree. It doesn't depend on any of those connections. It doesn't depend on if I have a record and I'm recently from being incarcerated or if I'm still incarcerated. It doesn't depend on whether I was involved in sex trafficking and now I've come into another life. He steps out of the physical reality and into the underlying reality that God has set for all of his people. And he says, who knows? He doesn't say I named it, I claimed it, I know it's gonna happen. He recognizes that God is free and sovereign. And just knowing that it's a possibility is enough for me. Just knowing that he can heal me. Just knowing that he can deliver me. I don't, I don't wanna use God like, like a, 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 some magic or a crystal. Uh, not something you just follow a formula and then God is obligated to do what I want him to do. It's not the way. God maintains God's sovereignty. God does not come down. God is not in my control. But God lets me know that his heart is inclined toward me. That I'm the apple of his eye. That he has engraved your name in the palm of his hand. That God was willing to get a tattoo at Calvary so he would never forget about you. That's how much God loves you and so Jonathan steps out and Jonathan begins to boast and he begins to brag and he says who knows who knows how God will act who knows God will take a sweet street sweeper and make him an executive who knows he'll take a child from a little country hut a one-room house with no bathroom and make, put him in an executive suite. Who knows? God will take someone with what they call a physical disability and put them over the corporation. Who knows? Maybe our God will act. And he does not need chariots. He does not need numbers. He does not need the things that people claim for power and for influence. He doesn't have to have the title among us. We don't have to be the big priest. We don't have to be the big prophet. We don't have to be the king like Saul. We don't have to fight over boundaries. All I need is to know that my God, my God can save. Oh, my God can save. He can save by many, and he can save by few. 
He can deliver me with money and he can deliver me without it. He can deliver me with a recommendation and he can deliver me when there's nobody to speak for me. He can deliver me when the doctors understand and he can deliver when they are totally confused. He can deliver when I'm sitting on top of the hill, but if he wants to deliver, he can deliver me in the valley. Who knows? But my God can act. Anybody ever seen God act up? Anybody ever seen God act out? Anybody ever seen God break the rules up? Anybody God say, you can leave. You don't have to stay small. You don't have to stay stuck uh, under a tree. You don't have to stay in a place where you refuse to be who I created you to be and who I purposed you to be. I heard something from a leading pastor. You'll know that our bishop preaches for, and they, they, they obviously fellowship, but they have something going on that's called tear, tear the roof off or take the roof off. You recognize the scripture right away. But that's that kind of rebellion. A couple writers have written books that I was born to rebel. Rebel is my middle name. I don't have to fit. It's okay. You were designed designed to be different, designed to stick out, summoned to be different. The odds don't have to be in your favor because God doesn't need odds. He doesn't go to Las Vegas. He doesn't need probabilities. He's not depending on a slot machine. He's not counting numbers on a card. God is doing what he wants to do. And when he shifts his weight, when he shifts his glory, when he stretches his hand, when his eyes land on your situation. So Jonathan begins to speak like a prophet. Jonathan begins to intercede like a priest. Jonathan begins to act like a king. And Jonathan says, my God can save, whether by many or by few. Take your seats and we gotta get through this in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, that, that's the God that deserves a praise right there. That's a God that deserves a praise. He's not waiting for the economy to change. He's not waiting for the next presidential election. He's not depending on the supply chain to get better. That's the God. That, that's the God. He's not waiting till you get that degree. He's not waiting till you find the love of your life. That's the God. He's not waiting till you get another certificate, till you get a preaching appointment. He's not waiting till the x-rays come back. That's the God. That's the, that's the one. That's the one I'm talking about. That's the one. That's the one. He doesn't care if you're 3, 13, or 93. If he decides to act, does what he wants to do. That's the God that Jonathan is talking about. He said nothing can hinder him from saving. The armor bearer, th th this armor bearer is amazing. He says, echo, echo, you got the echo? Okay, tell me wh what this echoes. He says to him, I should give it to you the way it says in scripture. He says, do all that your mind inclines to. I am with you. As your mind is, so is mine. Now, one translation will say, do all that's in your heart. As your heart is, so is mine. Who is that? That's the armor bearer. That is the armor bearer. Now, I, you're tracking with me. That's the armor But who is that an echo of, either before or after? Somebody say it. Ruth. Is that what you said? Ruth. That's Ruth. That's Ruth making a covenant with Naomi saying, where you go, I'll go. Your God will be my God. Where you're buried, I'll be buried. That's the language of covenant because our God is a covenant keeping God. And the issue between Saul and Samuel is a relationship struggle. It's, are you in covenant with the old way or the new way? But how many know that real Christianity is not either or? That to really know God, hallelujah, he's not limited to just one method and one move. And so here the armor bearer is like a Ruth. And the armor bearer says, he's not saying, now wait a minute, you, who gonna have a sword? You and me. And but one sword, and it's a couple thousands of them, and it's just you and I, and you're talking about leaving here on a high place, going to a low place to climb back up to a high place to fight the enemy but he catches the vision. And he says, all that's in your heart to do, I'll do it. 
all that's in your mind to do, the mind that you have, that's the same mind that I have. And that's the way we respond to the Lord when it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So now they're He's created his group. He's got his team. It's only two people, but they're in a line and they're together. And Jonathan says, now we will cross over to those men and we will show ourselves. So there comes a point that even though God is working, doesn't mean that we're going to be absolved of all risk. Doesn't mean we, don't, we, we won't get exposed at some point in the strategy. Because they go down the hill, we assume, hiding under shrubs and bushes and crags and rocks. But when they get down to the valley in the physically, geographically disadvantaged dis, uh, position, they're going to be out in the open. So there comes a point where you've got to have your head and your heart together before you're out in the open. He said, and then we will show ourselves to them. Now he has a strategy. He's realistic. He has contingencies. He said, when we get out in the open, um, we're going to see what they say to us. If they say to us, wait until we come to you. Now, he didn't say what they'll do, but I think he's going to say run. That's really, that's the only thing. I, you see anything else, Pastor Dom? If, if we're not going to stand down here, it's in the valley until thousands of Philistines come down here. I'm not going to fold my arms and be a target for the devil. Are you following me? That I'm not just going to sit still and stay depressed, stay in a low place, stay with my head in my hands, waiting for the adversary to take me out. I'm not going to get in a valley and just cross my leg and say, I can't help it. This is the way it is. Is. And so I'm not going to just give up like that. He said, so if they say, wait until we come to you, I lost it again. What is not described, but what I believe inevitably he is suggesting is that we're going to move. We're going to get out of there right then. That was not the right plan. He said, but if they say, come on up, he said, if they say, come up to us, <clears throat> then we will go up. And now here is another spiritual gift. He says, because if they say come up to us, that means, and this is formulaic language in the Old Testament, he said that means that the Lord has given them into our hand. So in other words, we have to know how to read the opportunity when it comes. And what is not an opportunity, we're not going to call it an opportunity. But if it is an opportunity, we're going to have eyes to see. But we had to take a risk to get to the place to have the option to have an opportunity. So he said, they, he said, and so they say, come up to us, then that's a sign for us that the Lord has delivered them into our hand. And so they showed themselves to the Philistines, and the Philistines began to mock them. They said, look, Hebrews are coming out of their holes where they've been hidden. Now, is, the insult is to call them Hebrews. Because Israelites did not call themselves Hebrews. Hebrews was their slave state. It was the condition of their bondage. They were no longer slaves. They were no longer under Egypt. So when Philistine, the Philistines called them Hebrews, and later on you'll see it's going to come up again. It's not the Philistines. It's, it's shocking them. And so Jonathan, and if anything, this should give them more get them more riled up and give them some razz. He said, they're coming out of their holes. Now remember, there were he Israelites who had hidden in caves, dugouts, hideouts, because they were fearful of the Philistines. There was another group who had been mercenaries, like David was later on, and who had, because this side was losing, they crossed over to the Philistine side. So there were Israelites who were I, I, I almost, oh, I would be in so much trouble. Bishop would never let me come back. Uh, oh, I almost wanted to say, like people from one political party, that step over into another political party, hoping to get votes, but I didn't say it. I did good. I, did, I didn't say what I was thinking. I really didn't say, I didn't, I didn't call nobody's name. Not no, but, but there were mercenaries. There were people who were paid to leave the Israelites and go fight for the Philistines. They were mercenaries. And so they were also referred to in a derogatory way because they had basically abandoned their own folks and their own side and their own team. And so um, when they get there, the, the Philistines are underestimating them. Let's talk about that for a moment. 
Jonathan has had discernment. If I had time, we'd talk about the power of discernment, but we don't have time. So we just underscore the word discernment to know they were given to their hand. Now they're being underestimated. Don't get angry when people underestimate you. Don't get angry. Count it all joy. When they underestimate you, they get out of your way. And you can not only exceed, you not only meet expectations, but you can exceed expectations. Where the person that's always, see me, see me, I'm here, see me, see me, I'm gifted, see me. Then when they don't meet the mark, it's a, it's a lower, it's a, a deeper fall. Are you with me? So, uh, can I use the name? Deacon Quincy Jones talks about how he was underestimated and told that he really didn't have the skills. He would never do what he wanted to do in terms of scoring music. And he talks about what a, what a privilege that was because then he, they didn't get in his way and he could get started and do. So no one was expecting Jonathan to do what Saul wasn't doing, sitting on the outskirts. And so Saul underestimated Jonathan, and the Philistines underestimated Jonathan, and said, oh, come on up. Just, just come on up here where we are. We're going to let you get here, because we know you came out of your holes. So Jonathan, another key point, climbed up on his hands and feet with his armor bearer. How do we go up? By going down, by being humble. Hands not up, but hands down on the ground. Remember that lapping water like a dog? Anybody know that text? On his hands and his feet. When you're on your hands and on your feet, what are you on? I got one good one. I'm glad for both of them. You're on your knees. You go, we, we go up. We, they laughing at me having one good knee. You, you get about 50 more years on you. We'll see what you got. <laughs> I might outrun you. I like to have fun. We go up in prayer and in consecration and in sacrifice. That's how we gain height. That's how we get distance. Not being on the mountaintop, hollering over that to devil. Devil, I'm coming to get you. But by going down, sometimes in a, what we call a prayer closet, in private, in secret, getting built up, hidden as it were and then exposed to the enemy. But the enemy is not aware that you are well able to do what Caleb said they could do. And so they climbed up on their hands and their feet. And when they got there, we're about finished. Mm -hmm. They got there. I'm not, uh, you just correct me if I go wrong. One sword, Jonathan and his teammate. Jonathan pushes them over. And the armor bearer carries the sword and he slays them. Now that sounds a little gruesome, but you have 30,000 enemy on a hill looking at you and see if you got a problem with somebody slaying them. You won't bother you at all. You have the enemy coming after your sons and after your daughters that you've prayed over and believed God for. You have the enemy giving you strange diseases and doctors saying we don't know what to do. And see if you have a problem when you begin to understand that heaven does suffer violence and you're willing to get violent enough to take it by storm. We're not talking about taking lives out. We're talking about taking the plots and the plans of the enemy out. And so what they did in just a furlough and part of an acre, they had already slain 20, 20 men. These two with one sword had already taken out 20 of the enemy after going down a steep hill, going through the valley and climbing back up another high crag. And they began to do that. The Philistines were amazed. They were like, what's happening? And they were in a pandemic. They were in a panic. And when they were in a panic, they began to turn on themselves. They began to fight each other. The enemy gets confused. We don't have to have an answer for everything. We just need to seek the mind of God, have the mind of Christ, do the will of God, understand what he's trying to get us to do, not get rigid, but be flexible, be fluid. I started to call this the, the 
rigor of our faith, but I figure you'd all turn off right away because we talk a lot about the vigor of our faith. You know, my faith is strong, my faith is vibrant, my faith is real, my faith is activated, but we don't talk about the toughness. That rigor means it has to be strict. It has to be adhered to. It has to be believed in the face of opposition. It has to be able to give birth out of barrenness like Hannah. It has to be willing to be misunderstood because they thought Hannah was drunk when she began to pray out of a sorrowful spirit. If you're going to be out of your place, if you're going to not be there when roll is called, uh, then you may get called all kinds of things. Uh, and it's not really that you're a rabble rouser, uh, but that you've got a vision. Uh, you're, you're not out of sync. You've got a team uh, and you're working not for your self-promotion, but to rescue a community and to get Israel out of bondage. Uh, and so when the Phil Philistines begin to fight each other, and they begin to go back and forth and they were just having tumult in the camp and this, the scripture says multitudinous number of army then Saul under the pomegranate tree looks out his, his lookouts see all that's going on and they want to know what's this commotion and so what he does is he calls for his ephod holder his, his outlawed uncredentialed priest self-made, self-licensed self-made apostle, whatever. He calls for him and he says, there's something going on over there. Come on, we, we, I need to know what's happening. He's falling back on a ritual when it's time to get engaged. It's time, it's not time to go and read up another book. It's not time to consult the commentary. It's time to be in the middle of the warfare. And so he calls for him. I guess he was taking too long. Whatever it was, he wasn't getting together. And finally, Saul gives up and he says, never mind, withdraw your hand. In other words, just, just stop trying to figure out what's going on. He said, bring me my roll book and let me give roll call. John, present. Shaniqua, present. Ezekiel Jr., present. Henry Mann, present. little boy, present. Junior. Baby sister, present. all of them are present, but he gets to Jonathan. No answer. He gets to Jonathan's armor bearer. No answer. Then he realized that they were saving the nation on an unauthorized leave. And after all of that, trying to consult the rituals, trying to be stuck in tradition, trying to fight with Saul, trying to grab for titles. Then what happens? He's like, let's get over there and get in this. He want to get in the winning side. And they scurry over and they get in the battle and they join the battle and they obviously win. But it's not because of them. It's because the Lord was in their plan. It's because God had another reality other than what they could see. It's because it wasn't what was in the strategy book, but it's what God has on tap for your life. If you could just believe, we're looking at the wrong indicators. We're listening to the, what do you call meteorologists. That's not the climate you're in. We're looking at somebody else that's charting something. What God has for us, it is not the ordinary means. It, that's why we can have peace in a storm. That's why life can come out of death, because we live in the tension. Uh, we are in, but not of. Uh, we were born and bred. Our DNA is about paradox. Uh, contradiction is our name. Uh, we were born not to fit, to tear the roof off, uh, to break the rules, uh, to do what God has given us to do, not for selfish motives, uh, but to save a nation. Uh, how many people here? Uh, are willing to leave Samuel fighting for whatever he's fighting for the old way and to leave Saul holding on, trying to forever be a king. Uh, but how many are willing to say, if there's just one sword, one God, one word, if I can just get one vision from the Lord, I'm willing to go.